Hello everyone, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, for those of you who've uh, joined the webinar on Be Waste Wise for the first time, let me just introduce Be Waste Wise to you. We're a nonprofit organization addressing the need for knowledge dissemination in waste management. We do this by uh, organizing webinars and co-learning sessions online. And uh, we organize at least two webinars every month on various topics related to waste management and sustainability. And uh, today, the webinar's topic is food waste in cities, helping residents to source separate using behavioral science. This particular webinar is actually based on uh, pilots that were recently completed in six cities in Netherlands. And we have uh, two authors from this report here with us uh, joining in as panelists. Uh, Kat Heinrich is a food waste specialist in Australia who's moderating this panel. We have Dan, who's an advisor on waste collection and recycling for the city of Rotterdam. And Heis Langewild, who is also another moderator on Be Waste Wise. And uh, he enjoys setting up initiatives to solve uh, problems related to circular economy and waste management. And before I hand this over to Kat, just a reminder that we will be taking your questions. Kat will be taking your questions as and when they come up. Uh, based on what is being discussed. So please use the Q&A section to share your questions. And uh, we will also try, in case your question is not answered in the webinar, we will try to get it answered uh, and put it up on our website. So do share your questions on the Q&A section. And uh, over to you, Kat. Thank you very much, Sweeper, for your introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. So as Sweeper mentioned, um, my name is Kat Heinrich. I'm based in South Australia. And I work as an associate consultant and director for Rawtech. And it's uh, my absolute pleasure to be moderating today's webinar about a topic that I'm very passionate about, food waste. And um, this, this webinar is part of a, a food waste series that we've been running together with Be Waste Wise. So you might have seen some of our previous webinars. Uh, it's actually myself and, and Heist Langeveld uh, who've been uh, running this food waste series. So you can check them out on the Be Waste Wise YouTube channel if you so care. Um, so over the past few years, I've been working with a range of different cities, looking at how to introduce and improve food waste recycling services. And the common barrier that keeps coming up is how do you get residents to actually put their food waste in the right bin? It sounds simple, but it's really challenging. And it gets even more challenging when you're looking at a high density environment, such as an apartment or a high rise building, because residents face even bigger challenges. So for example, they might not have space to store a food waste recycling bin, or they may, not, um, they may have to walk long distances to access it. So that's why I'm so excited uh, to be moderating this webinar today, which is presenting the findings from an innovative pilot that Sweeper touched on before, where six cities across the Netherlands looked to tackle this particular challenge. And they looked at 10 different behavior change interventions to look at how they could engage, empower, and enable residents to correctly sort their food waste. So I'm joined today by project manager Heis Langeveld, who I'll be asking a few questions shortly. And I can already see some questions going in the Q&A box. So I'll be asking, I've got a few questions prepared, but I'll also be weaving those in throughout. I'm also joined by um, Dan van den Elsen from the city of Rotterdam, one of the pilot participants. So Dan and Heis will be sharing the findings from the pilot, as well as challenges and lessons for other cities. So a little bit about Heis before I run into the questions for him. So I've known Heis for about five years now through the International Solid Waste Association. And if I could describe Heis in a word, it would be entrepreneur. Uh, he's very entrepreneurial and he's actually very good at projects that involve a whole range of different stakeholders to tackle a complex issue. And that's exactly um, the type of project that we're talking about today. So a warm welcome to your Heis. Well, thank you, Kat. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to cover for the audience um, a little bit of basics about the pilot that we're talking about. So can you start by telling us about the goals for the pilot? Yeah, sure. So um, the project was all about uh, how can you uh, learn how to increase source separation rates, mainly in highly dense areas. Uh, we have best practices available for lowly dense areas, but how can you do it in highly dense areas? Uh, so we were looking at solutions which are effective, affordable and practical feasible. And um, 
The thing is that what we look at major cities is that uh, they face uh, the challenge of reducing their impacts on environment and climate, but on the other hand, they are growing dramatically. And um, uh, so uh, an important strategy to achieve this goal towards uh, t transitioning towards uh, a circular economy is by using more waste as, uh, as raw materials. So, um, and, and when we started this project, cities like Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they didn't separate the food waste at all. So, um, what they actually wanted to achieve with this project was uh, to get started. Uh, we all know it's a long walk, uh, but you need to start somewhere. And um, uh, but what, when they wanted to start, they found out that there's actually not too many good uh, uh, research available on how should you do it. So scientifically some methods. Um, so the goal of the study, the second thing was not only to achieve maximum, uh, to achieve an effect, but it was mainly also about uh, what is working and what doesn't work. What is So it's primarily intended to determine the instruments of, of uh, behavioral instruments mainly, which work and which doesn't work. So. Um, the, but we lost, uh, the last comment that I want to make about this point, uh, point is that the waste industry generally has the intention to jump into solutions. We are very practical and we want to jump in, we want to realize stuff as soon as possible. But so in, 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 in uh, challenges, uh, major challenges, sometimes you need to do some, some research as well. So, uh, and it goes hand in hand and that's what we try to do in this, uh, in this research project. Mm, and I agree with you, Face. I've seen it certainly in South Australia, where I'm from, uh, we, where you see people um, keen to improve their systems and sometimes it's about trying to apply the approaches that have been done before, um, but they don't necessarily get the intended outcome. So it's really refreshing uh, to hear that there's a more scientific approach to looking at what works and what doesn't and then taking that really behavioural change science to apply to this. Um, I've got a question, so just before I launch into my other one, I've got a question in, you touched on this before, Heist, the relationship, um, you mentioned cities are trying to uh, reduce their carbon emissions and, and manage their climate change impacts. So I had a question here on how is waste linked to adaption to climate change? Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, in different ways. It's about materials and uh, um, uh, like climate change usually is only about CO2 emission rates. And uh, so by uh, recycling or reusing your materials, you can reduce the CO2 emissions. And uh, it depends on, on the type of waste material, how much it is, but that's the direct impact. Uh, indirectly, if you have a look at the, uh, the planetary boundaries, uh, we have like, th there has been identified seven to nine boundaries of our uh, planetary, of our planet. So, and on all those boundaries, we uh, waste links towards uh, those boundaries. So, uh, for example, uh, biodiversity of, uh, of our nature. Well, if we don't come up with solutions how to prevent litter, um, uh, well, we, we have a, a huge issue there because there will be contamination by plastics, etc. So uh, it, it, it links in more than one way. And if you're really interested in this question, I would not only look at climate change and Zich, but also have a broader look and, and have a look at the planetary boundaries, uh, which is uh, quite, um, uh, yeah, so that would be my suggestion there. Yeah, and um, it's interesting in particular <coughs> between climate change and waste, particularly today we're talking about food waste. And as we know, food waste is one of the biggest contributors in the world to climate change. So it's a very, in particular, it's a very important waste stream to be tackling as a city if you're looking to reduce your climate impact. So, Heis, I just wanted to find out a little bit more about the pilot. So which cities, I think you mentioned there were six cities involved. So which cities were involved and who else did you bring along to the party for this pilot? So yeah, there were 13 parties, six cities and other stakeholders involved. Uh, it's mainly the major cities in the Netherlands, which has, uh, or cities with a, a large percentage of highly dense, uh, of highly dense areas. So uh, the cities that were involved were Almere, Amsterdam, The Hague, Rotterdam, uh, Utrecht and uh, Schiedam. Uh, and Almere, um, and next to that we had uh, other stakeholders involved as well, such as the national government, uh, branch organizations, uh, both for cities but also for waste processors. So 
uh, what we tried to do is to set up a project which uh, which uh, covers the whole uh, waste chain. Um, so that's about the, the 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 supportive organizations. But on the other end, what we did in this project was not only having the waste industry. Uh, um, um, present but we also work with the think tank we're um, we're actually the major experts on behavioral change um, uh, we are involved so we had two uh, professors on behavioral change we had uh, some practical experts on behavioral change so and actually so it, it was a combination of both waste management and um, behavioral change experts and the pilot itself, I understand, went for a number of years. Can you give us a sense of the timelines for setting up the project? <laughs> yeah, so when we started in uh, somewhere in 2015, we thought, well, we're going to run this uh, project in, in two years. But actually, we just finished it up. So you can calculate your, for yourself. We, we bumped into some uh, major challenges. Uh, the pilots themselves actually were six to nine months. And uh, so... Um, uh, the, the whole project took much more time because there were other steps involved as well. So we started we, uh, with a reality check, uh, how much effect will will uh, potential solutions have. We did a literature review, we did some field research, and based on that, we actually started to design the pilots. But uh, uh, so so there were many steps involved before we got to the pilot stage. Yeah, actually, now that you say that, I think one of the first conversations I ever had with you was in Sao Paulo in 2015 about this, this project. So it, it, it did take quite some time, um, but it was worth the wait. And um, it, it does take time sometimes. Uh, challenges do pop up that you don't anticipate. Can you share some of those things that took a bit longer than you anticipated? Why it took later and longer, uh, the, the project? <laughs> Um, well, it's an innovation project. So um, uh, some of the, the the things that you're doing are new, and some of the things that you need for the project is uh, are new as well. So, for example, uh, um, how did we measure the the separation uh, rates and behavior? It was uh, first of all, we wanted actually to measure by by kilograms on how much kilogram do people offer, uh, but we needed a technical solution to actually individual measure that. Uh, so. Um, and uh, at a certain, uh, that took us some time to actually to see uh, are the solutions available or can we develop solutions with the market with market parties, and in the end, uh, it it was not uh, at that time uh, uh, technically viable systems which uh, which were reliable were not available. But that took us some time. So that that was one of the issues. Another issue was. Um, uh, was a, a privacy assessment. So uh, once we wanted to start with the pilots, uh, the privacy uh, uh, law got incorporated here in Europe. And um, so we needed to address uh, what are we doing with uh, the data of people? How are we going to store it? And uh, well, questions like that. So, and actually we did assess that at the beginning of the project, but because uh, a law changed during the, the project, we needed to assess it again. So that took some extra time there as well. Mm, that's an important point you make to make sure you're managing the, the data and protecting that well. Uh, so the behavioral interventions yourself that you were testing, so I think it was 10 from memory that you were looking to test how effective they were in helping residents to source and separate their food waste. Can you just touch across there? What are these 10 behavior change interventions that you were testing? Yeah, so um, first of all, what we identified from the literature is that um, uh, you need uh, uh, some basic uh, level of of, uh, uh, of things to be arranged. So that is, we took that in a basic package. So, and mainly you need your infrastructure uh, there. So that people need to have the opportunities to separate the waste. Uh, secondly, they need to have the uh, need to have the capacity to separate the waste. So they they need to know what what they should be doing. And thirdly, they should have the, uh, some kind of motivation to, to actually separate the waste. So, and those three things were uh, more, uh, more or less addressed in the basic package. So the basic package we introduced everywhere. On top of that, uh, we uh, tested uh, some very, uh, well, uh, some most promising interventions from behavioral science. So let me share my screen. Um, uh, and 
based on that, we came to a menu card. Uh, and actually, this is the menu card where the 10 uh, interventions are stored. Uh, so, uh, for example, facilitation store at home, that's the top one. Uh, we provided uh, in different cities uh, inhabitants with with uh, bins, and and we we try to identify the effectiveness of that. And um, uh, because we tested in different um, uh, areas, we are quite sure that facilitation store at home, so uh, that providing a bin for in the kitchen is quite effective. Um, and mainly the results of the scientific research are on the first column here, so on the effectiveness. The budget and practical feasibility, that's probably more or less, uh, it's, it's just, it's an estimation, uh, and that will probably also differ in local situations. So, um, um, and, and we tested the 10, uh, so um, the, the second one was charging, uh, was changing the distance towards a waste collection point, so how far do you have to walk to a certain point? We did something with, uh, with setting goals and activating them, um, both on a group as uh, as individually, uh, we tested influencing attitudes. So, uh, what is their attitude, and if you provide them with information, how do they change the attitude? Um, we did with social standards and activation, social modeling. So, setting an example by somebody, um, and uh, and and last but not least, we did also things with rewards and gifts, uh, and. Um, uh, so what what happens if you give them a, uh, either a reward or a gift uh, with their behavior? Thanks, and, and I just saw a, a comment there. Someone was keen for a, a, a zoom uh, zoom up on Zoom <laughs> on your screen, so they can better see the little pictures. But I should say this uh, diagram that you presented is also available um, in the report that you've just released, and an English uh, translated version is. Um, available on the link that Suica shared in the chat box if anyone wants to see a closer version of it. Um, but yeah, so quite a range of different interventions you were testing there, Hi. So that's uh, a lot of things to test. So how did you go about selecting your participating households? Who was, how did you decide who's in and who's out? Uh, well, that's actually a very good question because, uh, as I mentioned, we just uh, we are mainly focused on the goal of uh, what works and what doesn't work. So uh, you need a good uh, 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 the, the groups where you test. Uh, so uh, either the the group who gets the intervention, so the pill, and the, uh, and the group who didn't get the intervention, so the control group the, uh, who, who didn't get the pill, they need to be more or less similar in the, the type of uh, households who are present in each group. So what we did was first to identify the area where we were going to test. So it needed to be an area with highly dense uh, buildings, uh, uh, with similar buildings, so uh, not too many uh, low dense area. Um, so that you have a good testing uh, area. And secondly, what we did was uh, what they called uh, in English a randomized control trial. So each of the, the groups, so the control group or the one who gets the intervention, they were at randomized, uh, the, the, the households who were in, in which group. So what you get is that uh, each of the group gets this, a similar uh, type of household. So, um, and, and in that sense, if something happens uh, in time, uh, which happens in the in the treatment group and doesn't happen in the control group, you can see the difference. And at the end, you know what works and what doesn't work. So uh, yeah. that's opposed towards, for example, if you uh, compare flat one with flat two, uh, you don't know actually who is living in that specific flat. So at the end, you cannot compare it because uh, uh, the groups uh, haven't been similar in types of households incorporated. Yeah, it's so really important, as you say, to have both the control group and, and the group that you're testing the intervention on and making sure they've got similar um, circumstances, demographics, etc., that, that would influence behaviour. Um, I want to go back to the question, talking about how do you measure uh, whether or not people are using the systems correctly, sorting their food waste. I've got a comment here. Um, asking about the potential use of field, bin level field sensors um, and asking whether they would have assisted with the pilot. So can you first touch on what method you ended up choosing and, and how you went about that? 
Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Uh, we had similar questions when we designed uh, this project. And the main thing is that we actually wanted to, to measure on individual household level, so not on container level. Because then you can actually see what happens with the intervention. If you give a specific household a treatment, uh, you need to measure at the household level as well. So, because uh, otherwise, if you don't do that, if you measure at container level, you need very, very large pilot areas to get your, your population and to get enough population to actually uh, 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 be able to make significantly measure the changes. So we needed to measure at household level. And uh, what I explained is first we wanted to do that on kilograms, but that uh, technically was not possible at the time. So uh, what we did as an alternative is to measure on frequency. So how often do you uh, 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 go to the bin and actually offer your food waste at the bin? So that was mainly to measure the, 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 um, uh, the behavior of people. Um, so that was the first step. The secondly, what we did was ask, uh, uh, did uh, two or three times per pilot uh, ask question. Uh, did the questionnaires with people to see what's their motivation uh, underneath uh, the behavior. So that we actually at the end not only could say what worked and, and what didn't work, but also why it didn't work or why it worked. So that was the second type. Uh, thirdly, we for sure tested the quality of the collected uh, uh, food waste and also the residual waste. Quality is, uh, is is key. If you don't have a uh, good quality food waste, then uh, you're actually collecting residual waste. So uh, that's that's why you need to measure there as well. And what we saw in some pilots is that they uh, that they actually were able to increase their quality uh, majorly. And and we're at the first steps. Well, Dan can maybe explain explain more about this point in uh, for how they did this in Rotterdam. Um, and uh, so, and in some cases, uh, we also measured the quantity of the of the containers. Uh, so that's what's actually being proposed in the Q and A. But that was more more like a supportive uh, measurement. It was not a key measurement because, in the end, if you measure on containers, uh, you get a kilogram for the whole container, but you actually don't know who did deliver the waste and who didn't. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the system that you have in particular, because I'm thinking that the bins obviously are very different potentially in the cities you're talking about compared to say Australia. So I think, did you say you use chip, chip cards or something like that to see how many times the, the materials are deposited in the bin? Is that right? Yeah, we have used in different pilots both the underground collection system as uh, as what we call the, the 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 containers on top of the ground. But the containers on top of the ground, they have a, a small house around them. So it's actually it's like a 240 liter uh, mini container with uh, with a, a nice house around it. Uh, where uh, and all containers worked with uh, with um, a key uh, to uh, to actually access this because otherwise we couldn't measure. Uh, so that was the main reason during this experiment. But other reasons are also quality, etc. So, um, yeah. um, but we use two types, and um, uh, and what we found out is actually that that um, that the underground collection systems are are difficult to handle in in terms of quality. So um, uh, there's a quality issue there in, in most of the cases. Yeah. Okay, so now over to the exciting part, the results from the pilot. So you mentioned you tested these 10 different interventions. Which interventions were the most effective in getting residents to sort their, their food waste? But talking about results, I think the, the major result was uh, showing that actually if you implement the basic package, which I told you, uh, that you already can uh, get up to a 20 to 23 uh, percent uh, participation rate of, uh, of, of food waste collection. So actually by uh, just uh, arranging that the basics have been arranged, you can also you can already get to a quite good uh, uh, result and uh, in our case uh, we collected about 17 kilograms per person per year of organic waste or on on food waste which is kind of similar as in in lowly dense areas so um uh, it, it, that was the first major result 
uh, then if you look into in, uh, individual interventions, uh, I, I should warn that like some uh, always you should look at the local case uh, on what uh, and, and should have some kind of pre-assessment to see what what is probably working on or what what will not work. But the three interventions that work most of it, uh, uh, I will try to get the small table up again. Uh, I'm sorry for, for listening in uh, that the table is a little bit small, but you can uh, look it back in the, in the report. But um, the, the, the first one, uh, which is very effective, is facilitating store at home. I, I just explained that with a small kitchen bin uh, that works very, very much. It's uh, people have a constant reminder in the kitchen that they should actually separate the waste. So um, uh, it's a very, very strong one. Um, uh, and it's easy to implement. Um, the second one, which had a, a consistent, strong effectiveness, was influencing the attitudes of, uh, of people. So uh, that's uh, uh, actually getting into the minds of people by... Uh, 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 educating them on uh, the importance of, of waste separation. So well, um, we did that in several ways, um, uh, but uh, uh, it, giving them information on what happens with the waste and why it's important. Uh, it's important, for example, for climate change, the question which come up, uh, well, it actually works. Um, and the third one, which was really, really effective, was uh, setting group goals and, and giving them feedback on that. So what we did was at a container, we actually measured the whole container uh, and we said, say, well, you should, uh, well, your group, your goal as a group should be that you, you separate uh, X percentage of your waste. And by measuring the whole container, uh, there is actually where, where we used it as an intervention. Uh, and giving them feedback like two or three times on how did they do on their waste separation and maybe that they could improve or that they're doing very well. That was very, very effective. So those were the three major ones. The others also, uh, especially with two stars, they, they have quite some potential, uh, especially in, in, in some specific local conditions. Uh, but they were rated with one star lower because sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. It's interesting to see there on that little chart you had with the stars. Um, as you mentioned, one of the top performing uh, behavior change interventions was that group goal setting. But then there's another one on your list of interventions, which is setting personal goals, which had zero stars, um, which is just a strange thing. Humans are weird. <laughs> So it doesn't, it doesn't work to set your own goals, but it works as a group. That's, that's an interesting finding, Heiss. Did that surprise yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, well, that was one of the, the surprising results. Uh, so what we saw that allowing residents to set their own goals is, is less effective because they tend to send, uh, set less ambition goals for themselves. So uh, we measured with the questionnaire on what would be your goal uh, if you didn't have this intervention and what was your goal if you did have the intervention. And there was not so much difference between the two groups. So uh, th that's why actually the, the individual goal setting was, uh, was less effective uh, compared with the group goal. And you get a second thing which works as well is that uh, uh, people want to be part of a group. So, and if you, if, if the group is recognizable, for example, your flat or, or where you live, then uh, you want to participate together with the group as well. So actually you're combining different behavioral aspects there. And uh, that's, that's probably the reason why the, the group goals did work and the personal goals didn't work. Interesting. So hi, so I'm going to um, jump over to Dan now and I'll come back to you with some more questions. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our second panelist, Dan Van Den Elie, <coughs> um, who represented the city of Rotterdam for this project. Um, I also met Dan through the International Solid Waste Association and uh, he's worked on many different projects for the city of Rotterdam in the space of surfer economy and has a wealth of really practical experience to bring to bear for this project. Um, so welcome, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> so for the audience, uh, many people may not have even heard of Rotterdam before. Can yeah. you please just give us a little bit of context about the city, who lives there, how big is it, etc.? Yeah, no problem. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from the city of Rotterdam as well, working from the city of Rotterdam. And uh, Rotterdam is the second largest city of the Netherlands, um, with uh, just after Amsterdam, with um, uh, around 650,000 inhabitants. Um, and um, you might know Rotterdam because it has the uh, largest port of, uh, of Europe. Um, and that's also one of the reasons that our population is very uh, diverse. We have around uh, 175 uh, nationalities. Um, and um, yeah, we have, like Gijs already mentioned, uh, a lot of um, uh, highly dense areas uh, where a lot of people live in small apartments. Um, and um, um, yeah, and more in terms of waste management, we have a diversion rate of household waste of around 35%. Uh, very keen to improve that through um, separating food waste, for example, and uh, um, yeah, um, we have our own uh, uh, collection, uh, uh, waste collection uh, uh, company. Uh, so it's not contracted out. That might be relevant as well to mention. Yeah, and, and why is it that the city of Rotterdam decided to join this pilot? What was the interest for you? Um, yeah, so as you guys mentioned uh, just before, um, in the waste management sector, I recognize the same thing as you did. Um, it's very hands-on uh, uh, sector where uh, if we see a problem, we try to fix it uh, instead of just uh, taking some more time, uh, leaning back and, and trying to understand better why things are happening the way they are and um, doing some, some research. Uh, so that, that was one of the main goals, really. Uh, we want to really have some scientific backup in, in uh, how we're going to approach this problem. And uh, well, secondly, of course, as I mentioned, Right now, at a uh, diversion rate of thirty-five uh, percent, um, we want—we are very keen to improve that. Uh, our long-term goal in, in twenty fifty is to have no residual waste at all, uh, so no no more waste of energy for the city of Rotterdam. Um, and yeah, food waste is still a very large component of our residual waste uh, composition. So uh, yeah, that, that's 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 the that's the other reason why we are very keen to uh, to join this problem and. Uh, uh, Turn off Syria there, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so we we really hope to learn uh, from our own pilot and from the others. Uh, that that's also something. Yeah. That the collaboration that we had with the other cities in the Netherlands uh, was um, well unique in this way uh, for for such a big project. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, out of the six cities that were involved, each city tested a handful of initiatives. Maybe it was a two or three or something each. Yeah. Um, which uh, behaviour change interventions did you test in Rotterdam as part of this pilot? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share my screen uh, real short, um, just to give the audience a bit of an um, uh, overview of what it looked like. So this is one, we had five apartment buildings um, selected for this uh, uh, pilot. This is, uh, this is one of them, so it's a, a 13 story um, building with um, um, 158 apartments uh, on each of them. So we had five of them, that's uh, 760, around 760 uh, apartments. Um, and well, this is a typical setup that you can find in the Netherlands with underground uh, container systems. You can see the uh, small um, uh, chip card readers there where we uh, uh, measured uh, what household was uh, uh, taking part, um, dropping off, and uh, the two bins in the front are for the residual waste, and then in the back with the green indicator, you see the uh, uh, organics or food waste uh, container. Um, and as Gijs mentioned, we had some trouble with these underground systems for food waste, uh, where they uh, gave us a lot of uh, um, contamination, as you can see uh, right here. Uh, lots of plastics uh, going in there and uh, uh, stuff. Um, so before we started um, testing the interventions, we, um, we changed from the underground collection system to the uh, uh, bin on the, on the left. Um, with the above ground, very different type of container uh, than we used for residual waste. Um, and inside this thing, there's a, a, a regular wheelie bin, uh, uh, 240 liters, um, that they can, uh, where they can drop off and that are collection uh, uh, colleagues can uh, take out and empty. Um, 
so and, and this when we changed it over to, to this type of container we got a lot better uh, quality uh, hardly any uh, contamination uh, issues and uh, that was the moment that we decided to move forward on testing the actual interventions and um, for the city of Rotterdam we tested the um, storage at, at home so uh, we provided um, the randomized group um, uh, with these uh, small seven liter bins for uh, the kitchen counters and uh, uh, provided one um, roll of these uh, compostable bags that they could, uh, could use. Um, if they ran out, they, they had to buy their own at the supermarket. Um, and the other one that we tested was the um, um, setting personal goals uh, and activating. Um, so these, this image that you see now is, is uh, actually a, a magnet. Um, beforehand, we uh, checked with the uh, uh, social housing company that all the uh, fridges in these uh, apartments were uh, 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 suitable for magnets, and we provided them with a, a magnet where they could indicate from uh, they could set a goal for the amount of bags of residual waste that they were that they wanted to uh, uh, reduce um, per week, and they could tick off the boxes like I, I want to do it by separating my food waste, my glass packaging, my paper, and cardboard, plastic packaging, or textiles. Um, and the idea was that if they had this hanging on their fridge, uh, they were confronted with it uh, every time they opened the fridge, and um, um, yeah, that would influence their uh, their behavior. So that, that's the two things that we uh, that we actually tested. Mm. And what were what did you find? Because um, I remember the personal motivation from Heise's uh, slide beforehand was saying that didn't work. So was that the case for the magnet? Uh, the magnet uh, didn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. And there's, a lot, there's a lot of value in that as well, I think, with these studies is oh, yeah. know, there's a lot of value in finding out what doesn't work because you can imagine how much cost is involved with rolling out this system across the whole city. You want to know it works before you spend all the money. So, yeah, it, it's, I think it's just as valuable to, to find that out. Um, yeah, yeah, and how did, how did you engage the residents to participate? Or how did they sign up to get the magnet or how, how did you engage them in that process? Yeah, so, so pe people couldn't uh, uh, sign up themselves. Um, as we, uh, we had a base period in which we tested just their behavior with the basic package, like Gijs mentioned before handing out the interventions. Um, and based on their behavior, we randomized the group. So we'd have even um, groups to, to test um, interventions on and a control group to, to compare results. Um, so we decided what households would be getting the um, bin for the kitchen calendar, what households would be getting the magnet, and what households would be getting both. Um, so we had three groups with uh, uh, different interventions. And um, um, we did divide them, not uh, fully randomized, but we randomized by uh, half, um, uh, half the level of, a, of a, uh, an apartment uh, building. So uh, we had 13 um, levels uh, and 26 groups within one uh, um, apartment building. And that was because uh, we foresaw that if we were handing out these bins, people would get jealous of their neighbors, start calling us. Uh, so we decided, okay, they're, they're most likely to be in, in touch with with their half uh, from the elevator, looking from the elevator, their half of the apartment building. Uh, so we'll be handing out the same um, treatments to those uh, households to prevent as much uh, as possible that we, um, that, they, that they influence each other. Uh, so uh, that, that's, how we, uh, that's how we decided. And then when the whole um, testing was, was done, uh, they were all offered to receive a, a bin if they, uh, if they wanted um, uh, still. Uh, but there were, there were, yeah, there were, there were quite a number of people that, that still asked us for a, for a bin. And did you face any challenges throughout the project, throughout the pilot? Um, well, beforehand we thought that privacy would be a, a, a pretty big issue. Um, in the city of Rotterdam, we don't use any um, waste cards to, to uh, access containers. Um, it is, it is pretty common practice in uh, smaller cities in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, also for pay as you throw schemes. So that, that's what people would associate it with. Uh, we expected some, some uh, um, yeah, feedback on that, uh, but that, that wasn't the case at all. Um, 
people were totally fine with it. Um, and uh, also we had no one wanting to um, uh, stay out of the uh, out of the pilot or anything. Um, and the the yeah the biggest uh, challenge was the well at first the, the contamination of the food waste, and the second one was really to hold back my colleagues to uh, that uh, they they um, always try to to get as much food waste like a, in a project like this to get as much food waste out of these households as possible. Whereas uh, now this time we were really trying to measure what are these interventions doing actually. And if there's no mm -hmm. result, that's a result as well. And that's good. Exactly. So there was a mind uh, thing uh, going on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So resisting the temptation to influence the results. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the contamination issue before and how you switched across from the underground to the overground containers. So I have a question here from Luca. Uh, hello, Luca, mm -hmm. listening in. Luca Terenza. Um, why the smaller overground containers are better performing in quality than the underground, in your opinion? Are they both equipped with control ID access? Yeah. Yeah, so they're both uh, uh, um, using control uh, access uh, with the ID uh, cards. Um, what, what we did uh, as well to, to check was if there were possibly some, some households uh, sabotaging the pilot if, because they were not uh, uh, very enthusiastic to, to start separating their food waste. Uh, that wasn't the case. It, 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 well, from the data, it looked really uh, just random. Um, and what, what, I, what we took from that is that um, although that we did indicate the, the food waste container with the green uh, banner, the sticker, the, and they, they all got a letter about what we were going to do. Um, it, it still looked too similar to, uh, to a residual waste uh, container. Um, and even though we, we narrowed down the, uh, the opening, uh, people were still putting in the, the, the plastic bags and residual waste. Um, and for my, yeah, for, I think that the, um, the thing that we put on the ground instead of underground it was just a, a completely new thing um, that was there for a completely new uh, waste stream that they were uh, keeping apart. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's that, that was uh, key in, in, in getting rid of that uh, contamination because when we made the change, it was, it was well, practically gone. Um, a few- Yeah, it's interesting because it's, yeah. it's really obvious change in the bin set. So I guess people will suddenly pay attention. Oh, this is not my normal bin. What yeah. goes in this bin? So. That's interesting. And I've got another question here um, from Kendall Christensen. Um, with a diverse population, did you find or address cultural differences in food waste? Um, no, not, not really. Um, we did have uh, um, that type of data for the, uh, um, for, the re for randomizing the, the groups. Um, so we, we did have uh, uh, um, we did take that into account, but we didn't find any particular differences um, in that sense. No, might be that well, it was too small for that as well. And also yes. to comment, to 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 additionally comment on this one, Catherine. Uh, Kat, is that uh, actually we were looking also into interventions which can easily be scaled up. So uh, that should be interventions which work for any cultural background. So um, uh, uh, for sure we did measure whether there was an impact on uh, on, on basis on, on, on a diverse cultural background, but our intention was actually to have interventions which, which work anywhere. Mm. And I've got another question here. Did you, and this is for both of you, um, did you measure both the short-term and long-term effectiveness of the intervention? So maybe I'll start with Down to talk about the Rotterdam yep. <laughs> example before moving on to, to Heiss on that question. Yeah, so, um, yeah, what, what is, what is long-term? Um, we did <laughs> measure uh, for uh, over four months in the case of Rotterdam to, to see uh, if the effect would still be... Uh, would still be there um, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, in, in, for the, um, uh, um, the the kitchen counter bins that was the case uh, there were still the, uh, that population was still significantly um, uh, uh, separating uh, more food waste than the uh, uh, households that didn't receive one um, yeah for, for the magnet we didn't see any uh, difference uh, from the start so uh, 
yeah, that, that just has no effect. Also in the long term, no effect. Okay, and and Chais from the other cities as well, because you looked at six cities um, in terms of measuring the short and long term effectiveness of interventions. How did you go about that? Yeah, I think it's a very valid question, a very good one. And uh, actually, the effects of the interventions do deteriorate over time. So the interventions that continue to have a significant effect after two or three months, uh, they are actually mostly characterized by some form of repetition. So either the bin is there still in place or uh, it has been repeated. Uh, and to achieve actually a, a stable behavioral change, it's therefore, I think, advisable that, uh, that we should continue stimulating the desired behavior for an extended time of period uh, or to execute interventions periodically. And uh, just doing this implementation at once uh, may have a short-term effect, but on the long run, you need to, uh, uh, you need to support this. And uh, maybe after a certain type of years, then uh, 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 behavior has been common. But uh, behavioral change isn't uh, something which you can done in just uh, a week or something. Uh, mm. Even uh, changing our behavior towards COVID uh, took some, some weeks to actually realize what was happening and that you should change your behavior there. So, and uh, changing behavior is hard. So um, um, it takes repetition to do this. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Very important point there. So I think I recognize another person asking a question here, Jürgen Jacobi. Um, asking about the specifics of, of the system in the Netherlands. So um, was food waste disposed in paper bags or how did the household dispose of the food waste? So Dan, if you could just share the example from uh, Rotterdam. Yeah, in, in Rotterdam, uh, and I think for most of the uh, Dutch cases, this is the case uh, right now, uh, people use the um, uh, compostable plastic bags. But there are some, some paper bag examples as well. Yeah, yeah and, and only in Utrecht we use the paper bag. Okay. Yeah. And I've got a question from Bronwyn Jones. Uh, what about smells in the bins from rotting food waste? Is that, I guess that links to frequency on how often it's collected. So, uh, yeah. Dan, again, if you can start by talking specifically about rotting. Dan? Yeah, we had a weekly uh, collection um, and we didn't have any um, complaints or, or, or questions about the uh, uh, smells. Um, this was uh, um, so th this was for done for um, over a little over a year in total uh, for us um, because we made the switch in containers. Um, but, but yeah, overall we didn't have any complaints around that, not even in, in summer. Um, but uh, uh, we are planning to, to roll out uh, food waste collection and also do something around cleaning these uh, bins uh, on a regular basis. Hmm. And a question for Heis, um, is there a pay-to-throw system in any of the cities that you studied and is it among your recommendations to further improve collection? Uh, it's an interesting combination for sure to to uh, to have pay as you throw. The thing is that if you introduce a pay as you, as you throw system, the, the people should actually have an infrastructure available where you can separate your waste. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense to introduce a pay as you throw system because you want to make uh, increased separation. And in many of these cities, uh, for example, the coll a separate collection of food waste uh, hasn't been arranged yet. So first you need the basics uh, available. You need a system where people actually can separate their waste and it's not, and it's not made too hard to do that. And then you can talk about the pay as you throw system. So um, uh, I think it's a very interesting combination, but if you do it the other way around, you get a lot of, uh, the, the I think many uh, people in, in the city will will uh, uh, um, pose against it because uh, they don't have any uh, possible way to separate the waste and then they need to pay for it. So uh, for sure they pay it in a different way usually. But uh, so um, I, I think here it's uh, it's uh, to do it in the right uh, order of uh, things in the in time. Absolutely, and and from my research, uh, looking at the effectiveness of free waste systems um, overseas and around different cities. What I found is uh, pay to throw really does work. It, that price signal is a very, very effective way to drive a heavy change. But like you say, heist, you need to first have the infrastructure and the, the recycling systems in place before you can go down that track. So 
But yeah, is it something uh, dumb? Is it something rather dumb? Uh, would introduce at some point having paid you throw for high density, or do you already have it? Or no, we, we don't have it at this moment. Um, um, yeah, well, it, it, it's a it's a political uh, uh, choice in the end. Um, I, I do see that it's a very effective uh, way to uh, to improve uh, um, separation um, among your households. Uh, a lot of a lot of cities in the Netherlands uh, have a very effective system uh, this way. Um, there is a bit of a uh, challenge uh, concerning the uh, uh, contamination because uh, people might be incentivized to um, contaminate the, uh, the the separate streams uh, to avoid paying um, of course but um, yeah I, I think if you if you provide a, a, a well enough infrastructure like many cities in the Netherlands already do uh, mm. the contamination issues can be uh, reduced to a minimum um, right now we in the, for, for the city of Rotterdam we um, are also dealing with some some illegal dumping issues and that's also one of the reasons why um, uh, the decision right now is not not made, being made for uh, um, uh, pay as you throw system because it might incentivize more uh, illegal dumping um, and we want to avoid it uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. oh, it's really important to manage that illegal dumping. Dana shared some of the photos of me previously <laughs> on how people love to stack their trash next to the bins instead of putting it in the bin so you yeah. just scratch your head sometimes. <laughs> Luckily most people <laughs> still want to do the right thing but there's a, there's a minority that uh, uh, yeah we need to get or it's a bit of it's a bit of herd behavior as well because people see oh uh, you know someone's left their their rubbish next to the the bin oh it must be full so therefore i'll just yep. stack my rubbish very neatly next to the other pile yep. uh, it, it is very challenging and, and it's interesting um so to contrast in milan they have a system of very high density cities um and they've got a system of, of fining uh, buildings, um, whole buildings, in fact, if they contaminate the load, so the, the fine will be uh, passed on to, to the strata manager. And it, yeah, it does work really well for, for Milan. So I think there is a solution there. Um, that's again, that's a series of fines. Um, there is potentially a solution there for minimizing contamination. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's like a, a fine is kind of like a price signal in a way, because if you not only do you get it if you if you um, contaminate your bins, but you also get it if you don't source separate. So I think that is a really effective measure to also consider for high density cities. So I've got lots of questions coming in here. I'm trying to get through them. <laughs> um, so we have a question um, from Jo Hendricks. So I know Jo as well, hello. Um, she's actually in Adelaide, so shout out. Um, question for Heiss, uh, what were some of the other incentives or rewards offered? Uh, yeah, well, we did actually, um, uh, then you're talking about the gift and the reward incentive. Um, yeah. So uh, th that's both been tested in, um, in Amsterdam. And uh, let me have a look, if I can quickly look it up in the report and share it with you, because probably uh, a picture tells more than, uh, than, um, uh, than a thousand words. Uh, just wait a sec, please. Uh, so what you see here is in the report, we explained all the uh, the incentives. This is Amsterdam. And uh, here on the left side, uh, you see with a, a, a cutting um, board where people can cut their, uh, their, uh, their food. And we give this as a gift uh, and, and say, well, if you're using this gift, then um, um, then um, uh, you c please use this gift and, and separate your food waste as well. So it's a preemptive gift. Um, so that one was tested, and the other one uh, that was uh, was a reward, and that was uh, is on the right side. Uh, it's a reward for good behavior, and actually this is a, a soap made out of a coffee uh, drip, and um, uh, which is being produced next to the. Um, um, the area where we tested. So there was a very good story here uh, about uh, what's actually being made out of your waste. So those were the two things that we tested with uh, um, uh, physically uh, on, a, on a gift and, uh, and reward. 
but there are very many other ways to do it as well. So we just tested two things which were locally uh, um, viable and made in, uh, probably should make impact. Uh, the thing is with gifts and rewards is that they are actually in your uh, extrinsically uh, behavior. So uh, it works, uh, but it only works when you keep doing it. Uh, so it doesn't get into your intrinsically behavior. Uh, so uh, some other interventions, they work uh, uh, into uh, the deep inside of you. Um, so this one only works uh, at one time, but uh, uh, it, there is a specific why this one is very, very interesting. And that is because it triggers people who actually didn't separate the race before. So you can get into groups which you don't get with regular uh, uh, intervention. So if you would be able to combine this together with one which motivates you on intrinsically uh, 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 the people, then you have a very, very strong effect, I, I expect. And um, so uh, this type of intervention uh, is, is uh, you should think of it, well, it only works once. So there should be a long-term incentive there as well, but you mm. can target specific groups here. Mm, interesting, interesting. Um, and we've got a question here about uh, from Adi Prasad. Uh, for some of the interventions, for example, influencing attitudes and group goals, do you think that the effectiveness would drop as soon as human interaction, for example, the leaflets talking to residents, stops? So does that one have longevity with the group influencing attitudes and, and group goals, or do you need to keep reinforcing with leaflets and talking to residents? Yeah, I think we elaborate on that point already that uh, uh, so interventions need to be repeated. And uh, what I just explained about intrinsically and extrinsically uh, a behavior, well, that especially applies to uh, to leaflets, etc., and talking to residents. So um, uh, here, I think it's uh, on the one hand uh, repeatedly being done uh, to 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 keep the effect going. Yeah, that's needed. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I think I think this one has been discussed more or less already. Mm. And Dan, um, now that you've done the pilot in Rotterdam, what is your plans now that the pilot is at the end? What are you going to do with the results? Yeah, so uh, we're currently quite busy on um, uh, preparing a rollout uh, for food waste collection in these uh, apartment buildings. Um, Early 2021, we will be uh, introducing this uh, uh, source separate collection for food waste uh, for 20,000 extra households, and then uh, build on from there uh, the next few years. Um, well, yeah, and in, in the end, all of our residents will be separating their food waste. Right now, we have around um, 80,000 households already um, separating their organic, so that's garden waste and food waste combined. Um, and for these uh, for these apartment buildings, it will be well. They, they could they could have some some flowers or plants uh, that they have in the house. Put it, put them in there, but it will be mainly focused around food waste, and that will be uh, around uh, two hundred seventy thousand extra households in the end. So um, yeah, we still have quite some uh, work to do, and we'll be definitely we we are using these um, uh, results already. Uh, we will be uh, handing out these. Um, small bins and uh, we're actively looking at how we can automate the um, uh, group feedback for example that was tested in uh, in Schiedam, uh, and which proved to be very effective um, how we can use it in, in these bigger groups as well uh, by automating uh, uh, the, uh, the feedback mm, so there's some some of the experiences from other cities that you're going to apply to Rotterdam and yep, in, in the rollout of the yeah. systems yeah yeah. All right, well, I'm aware of the time and we are nearing the end of our webinar session and I'm sorry, we haven't got through all the questions, but as we said at the beginning, um, we will be uh, keeping a record of these questions and I understand um, Dan and, and Heis will be able to answer some of um, those in written answers, uh, perhaps not straight away because I know uh, Heis and Dan are kind of in holiday mode at the moment and in fact, Dan is uh, in the middle of his holiday right now, so we're even more grateful to have him joining us today. Um, but to leave the uh, audience with a, a bit of food for thought, um, I'd like to ask you both a question, um, and I'd like to start with you, Dan. 
Um, what three takeaways would you like to leave the audience here today um, when it comes to this particular pilot and this experience that you had? Three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, uh, for, first one for me would be uh, uh, if, you, if you're going to work on a pilot like this, just expect the unexpected. Um, we thought of a lot of problems that we might encounter along the way, but um, the contamination definitely wasn't one of them. We, we thought we really nailed this new design for the food waste uh, container um, underground. Um, but in the end, yeah, that, that was uh, quite, a, quite a challenge. Um, whereas the, the privacy uh, uh, didn't end up to be uh, one of the challenges. Um, second one is to, um, yeah, to, to really keep your colleagues in check. <laughs> Uh, if you if you if you are aiming for for uh, achieving some scientific uh, um, uh, gaining some scientific knowledge, um, and last one is uh, um, yeah I think I think the main for me the main takeaway from this uh, project actually is uh, just put a, a, a sound um, base infrastructure in place and, and people will already start um, um, with performing quite quite well actually above expectation. Um, Whereas for long, we, we all thought, well, it's very hard to, to get food waste out of these uh, apartment buildings. But uh, in the end, it, yeah, you just have to put the infrastructure in there and people will start doing it uh, already. And you can, of course, increase by uh, interventions. But uh, yeah, that would be my three takeaways. Thank you, Dan. And Chris? Well, Dan already put the first takeaway for me. So I, I you only have two takeaways now. Um, but I totally agree. Just uh, actually what I wanted to say to everybody or to all cities around the world is that uh, you need to get started. It's a long, it's a long walk and um, uh, you need to start somewhere either with pilots or with small areas or with a total rollout uh, and you will generate the benefits and it will be uh, as Dan, um, Dan explained, not an easy walk, but uh, you will reap the benefit, the fruits at the end of it. And, uh, this scientific research is only uh, a part of that specific walk. In the end, uh, this research only elaborates on the knowledge and how you can do certain things, but cities still need to implement it and, and see what works for specific areas and whatnot. So that will be the first point. The secondly is that uh, I think we need to share more information about this. Like many cities around the world face similar challenges. Um, we started with uh, in the Netherlands with a platform where we share a knowledge between cities in the Netherlands, which was quite unique, but because it wasn't there before based on this project and uh, where we focus mainly on urbanized problems. But I think uh, also internationally, uh, it would be very good to, to collaborate on, on, on this specific issue, maybe on other issues as well. For sure, there are some platforms uh, already in place, but um, uh, I think because food waste in specific is such a challenge for not only cities here uh, in, in the Netherlands, but also in New York or in Adelaide or in San Francisco or around the world, I see uh, comparable studies in London, for example, and it, it is really of added benefit to, to, to share insights about that. And, and lastly, uh, I think before you have the last word that uh, I think uh, this type of uh, webinars are also very helpful in that. And uh, I think Kat, you did an excellent moderation for this. So, uh, uh, and it's a good opportunity to share. So um, maybe other uh, projects could, could uh, use this type of platforms as well. Thank you, Heis. Thank you, Dan. Uh, fantastic insights there. And uh, just to build on what you're saying, Heist, there is a survey that we've been sending around um, and we'll, send, we'll try to tweet through if that's all right through uh, being waste wise as well for the participants um, to collect this data that Heist was talking about in terms of identifying those, those common challenges, but also opportunities to potentially work across cities to share the learning, build on the knowledge and because there's no point reinventing the wheel. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Heis and Dan, for your insights today. Um, your voice uh, have really, really, really provided some very valuable takeaways. And I can see the comments flowing through the chat group. People are excited um, that they've, they've had this opportunity. Please do check out the um, report that uh, we have shared. There's a full report. I think, gosh, I, I read it myself. It was <laughs> a very long report, but lots of additional valuable insights in there if you really want to get into the detail of it. 
um, it is available. So um, please do check it out and uh, feel free to reach out. Um, Dan and Heiss, you're both on LinkedIn. I'm just going to dob you in. Please feel free to, uh, you know, get in touch with them if you've got any uh, further questions. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Sweeper and Be Wastewise for making the platform available. Thank you, Kat, and thank you, Heiss and Don. It was a really, really good webinar. I learned a lot uh, about the report, and uh, I am usually one of those people that actually has a little bit of uh, difficulty reading through a long report. So this is a very good webinar, and uh, I'm sure you can see the comments, and people are really thankful for the insights that you've shared. Uh, and uh, to the audience, you will see Heiss and Kat again on the Be Waste Wise platform because they are moderators on our platform, and they are doing a series on uh, food waste for us. And uh, as uh, Kat already mentioned, for all the questions that have not been answered after both Heiss and Dan are back from their vacation, we will get the answers from them and put it up on our website along with the recording for this panel. So uh, that's it from my end. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, have a good day wherever you're at right now. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.